a republic, if you can keep it. Nobody knows what diseases they're bringing in, what, um, what they mean for this country, what, uh, you know, what they're gonna bring to this country, what our country is gonna turn into. They're replacements, that's really what they are. I'm Todd Zwillick, and this is Breaking the Vote, our series where we track the growing assault on voting rights and efforts to undermine democracy in America. America isn't like other places. We would never follow a strongman, or would we? Donald Trump's followers stormed the Capitol to stop the peaceful transfer of power. And now, January 6th apologists and even some participants are the rising stars of the American right and they're vying for control over future elections while the few Republicans who dared condemn the coup attempt are being purged from the ranks of the loyal. The truth is that one side of our two-party system is rejecting the rules of democracy and embracing absolute power. Here was the former president at a recent tele-rally praising Massachusetts gubernatorial candidate Jeff Deal. And he'll rule your state with an iron fist and he'll do what has to be done. Ruling with an iron fist is like classic authoritarianism. It's even a cliche. And Trump has praised the iron-fisted rule of dictators like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping in the past. On the most basic level, authoritarianism is what the founders feared most. It's why they created layers of checks and balances and bolstered them with strong institutions. So where is the far right looking for inspiration and a blueprint for how to transform your democratic system into a version dominated by authoritarian rule? Overseas, to this strong man who champions a racist so-called illiberal democracy. And the GOP is listening. We Hungarians know how to defeat the enemies of freedom on the political battlefield. And right now there is rising authoritarianism that even some Republicans can't deny. Do you see any strains of authoritarianism in the Republican Party? Well, there's no question we see some, some signs of that, and I'm, uh, you know, I've been one of the ones speaking out. This week, we look at how Republicans across the country are using state power to fight their culture wars and punish those who object. Plus, renowned historian Ruth ben Giat explains how charismatic strongmen like Trump prey on the public using fear and hate and disinformation and how they can rip a democracy apart. But first, we take you inside a conservative conclave in Dallas this summer where Republicans consummated their love affair with a pinup of international autocracy. It's fantastic to be here in Texas, the Lone Star State of the great United States of America. Hungary is the Lone Star State of Europe. Progressive liberals didn't want me to be here because they knew what I would tell you. Because I'm here to tell you that we should unite our forces. This war is a culture war. Have you heard much about Viktor Orban before today? I have. I actually, he's the, he, back in when the whole migrant crisis happened in uh, Europe, he was the only leader going, yeah, if you're coming to Hungary, you're going to be Hungarian. None of this, you're going to stay what you were, because you're going to respect our country. It's like, what's the point of coming to another country if you're just going to bring all your stuff? Like, the Latinos that are coming in from Central and South America, they're supposed to leave their problems behind. But yet, instead of waving American flags, going, oh, we're so grateful, we want to become citizens, they're waving their flags and looking like an invasionary force rather than refugees. You should know that I am an old-fashioned freedom fighter. I am also the longest-serving prime minister in Europe, the only anti-migration political leader on our continent. What did you think about what you heard from Prime Minister Orban? Well, I think his perspective is absolutely fabulous, and I wish people would understand what got communism to communism. They didn't just wake up one day and realize our country was communist. The communism starts with socialism and integrated ideas that make it sound like, you know, and I'm a social worker, I'm a licensed master of social work. 
They make it sound like we're going to be doing great for the greater good, the global good, and for all of these wonderful ideas for other people and helping people. And that's not how it comes out. Orban gets described sometimes as a Christian nationalist in his country, even an authoritarian. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you think well, I, th I think that country is very prosperous. And I think they're, you know, that country is doing very well. Uh, you know, the rest of Europe could actually take some clues from that country. And being a Christian and being a nationalist is not a crime. It's not a crime. I 100% stand with Orban and Hungary and the nationalists and the Christians, you know, and, it, and I'm, just for the record, I'm not white, you know, I'm, I have a little bit of German but mostly I'm Comanche. So, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a white nationalist or anything else that the left tries to portray us as. So I love my country. I want my country to be put first. I want America to be put first. And nobody knows what diseases they're bringing in, what, um, what they mean for this country, what, uh, you know, what they're gonna bring to this country, what our country is gonna turn into. They're replacements. That's really what they are. Replacements. What, they're, they're replacements. You know, I mean, that's for what for the American people. And you know what? He has the right to keep his country Hungarian, just like we have the right to keep our country American. Why does the left constantly bring race into everything? Why does everything have to be a race? But what he are did. You, are you guys trying to divide everybody? I mean, seriously, that's really what this is. He's not a racist. I'm not a racist. They're all races in this country who are Americans who were born here, just like there are all races in his country who are Hungarians. You know, so it's not just one race. You guys are trying to make this racist, and it's not racist. You What's know, the... this is about his country and Hungary. You know, and this is about the United States of America and making the United States of America first and, you know, first and foremost. That, that's what this is about. Don't worry, a Christian politician cannot be racist. A Christian politician cannot be racist. Okay, glad that's cleared up. That visit from Orban was just a few weeks after his own supporters delivered exactly what he wanted, a second term. Matthew Castle followed Orban's path to re-election, and he joins me now. Matthew, Orban wasn't just imported to the U.S. by chance. It, it looks like there's some kind of authoritarian right-wing exchange program we've got going on with Hungary here. Yeah, that's right, Todd. When Viktor Orban first came to power in 2010, he wasn't on the radar of many people outside of Hungary. But in 2015, during the global refugee crisis, Viktor Orban became famous or infamous when he led one of the harshest crackdowns on refugees and migrants in Europe. Since then, he's become a hero to many U.S. conservatives for this kind of, you know, conservative utopia that he's created in Hungary. This is our report on some of those U.S. conservatives who are living in Budapest, hoping to learn from Orban and his very unique style of government. The Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, has secured a fourth consecutive landslide election victory. The Fidesz party cruises to a fourth straight win. Kedves barátaim, hatalmas győzelmet arattunk. Mi győzelmünkért jó szívvel gondolunk az amerikai barátainkra, akik velünk voltak és segítettek bennünket az elmúlt hónapokban. On April 3rd, Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban won his bid for re-election as the leader of this medium-sized Central European nation. At this election watch party in Budapest, it wasn't just Hungarians who were excited about the victory. What does Viktor Orban's re-election tonight mean for conservatives in the U.S.? I think it'll continue to heighten American conservative interest in what Fidesz and the Orban government are doing. I'm thrilled. It's good to see countries that, like Hungary that don't hate themselves and don't want to destroy the essence of civilization. Do you think there are elements of Orban's style of government in Hungary that could work back in the U.S.? 
I'd say that the Child Protection Act in Hungary was definitely an inspiration for DeSantis and other Republican governors. I think Hungary's migration policy should be pursued by Republican politicians. I think the United States could learn a lot from that. Republicans are looking for inspiration for the future of their party, and they're finding it in Hungary's prime minister. Since 2010, Orban has ruled the country guided by the belief that Hungary can only be saved from immigration and multiculturalism by restoring its Christian identity. Európa és Magyarország egy civilizációs küzdelem kellős közepén áll. Egyszerre kell tehát. Orban has distinguished himself from other European leaders by railing against the EU, liberal democracy, and racial diversity. Ezért harcoltunk mindig, egymással hajlandóak vagyunk keveredni, de nem akarunk kevert fajúvá válni. Ezért harcoltunk. During the global refugee crisis in 2015, Orban implemented the harshest anti-refugee measures in the European Union. His government prosecuted asylum seekers from the Middle East and built a border wall to prevent them from entering Hungary. His tough stance on immigration catapulted him into the limelight and made him a hero to U.S. conservatives. The Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, even held its first ever European event this year in Budapest, where Americans mingled with their Hungarian allies. To our critics, we say this, we're proud to be in Hungary. Now, right-wing Americans, many on fellowships backed in part by the Hungarian government, are flocking to Budapest, hoping to export the Orban model back to the US. Steven Scholl is one such fellow. Well, welcome to Budapest. He's here to study how Orban's government is presenting itself as a defender of traditional values by restoring the city's classical architecture. Why is there an appeal to the past? For many people, appealing to the past builds a level of importance. It, it is reminding people that, you know, you come from a great line of people. What is a more visual depiction of your ideology, of your culture, of your society, than the architecture you see? What is it about Budapest, about Hungary, that is making it so appealing to U.S. conservatives like yourself? Hungary is a place where policies can be put into practice. I think there's a lot of feelings in conservative circles that, you know, Trump's talked a lot and then didn't actually do a lot. So I think there's a perception in Orban that don't just talk about something, but concretely do. Americans who come to Hungary often spend their time here, at the Scruton Cafe, named after a prominent British conservative philosopher. It's a popular hangout for the likes of Harvard scholar Gladden Papen, who's been in Budapest for a year studying Orban's policies. What do you want to take from this country and bring back to the US? American conservatives have some um, anxiety about using power um, when they have it, which ultimately I think is their undoing. Orban has a pretty no-nonsense approach. He's a no-bullshit politician who has both the vision to establish and defend Hungary as a you know, traditional uh, Christian society. He's a controversial figure in Europe. That's right. undeniable. Yes, he's And he's controversial for certain reasons. Yes, he's controversial because he rejects the liberalism part of liberal democracy. As an anti-liberal, I think that that's good. Does being anti-liberal mean doing things like changing the Constitution in your favor? Yes, obviously. We should pass into the U.S. Constitution anything that, that, that is, you know, fundamentally required in order to protect the things that have been taken away by other forms of legislation or by the Supreme Court. It sounds like you still don't think same-sex couples should have the kind of rights that men and women, a female and male couple, should have. Traditional families should have pride of place in any society, and the traditional family, uh, you know, defined according to the law of nature itself, as a man and a woman coming together and bearing uh, their natural children. Hungary affirms what the, that the, uh, what the traditional family is. It's defined in the Constitution that a family is uh, the marriage of a man and a woman um, that come together to bear children. It's a pretty simple choice. Either we reaffirm what the true natural family is, or else it's just chaos on the other side. Promoting what it calls traditional families has been one of Orban's main policies. His government gives straight couples financial incentives to, well, make more Hungarians. Nora Kirali is a mother who benefits from the family policy. With five children of her own, she'll never pay income tax again. She's also running for parliament as a member of Orban's Fidesz party. Hát ugye a 
családok támogatása, az, az, a, az egyik legfontosabb, a közbiztonság, az, hogy nincsen itt Magyarországon migráció. We've heard a lot about this family policy. Can you explain what it is exactly? Kormányzás központjában a családok állnak. Ugye van olyan ország, aki a külföldiek betelepítésével próbálja elérni azt, hogy több gyermek szülessen. Gondolok itt a migrációra. Ugye Magyarországon a magyar kormány nem a migrációval akarja elérni ezt. In your opinion, what's the problem with increasing the population through policies like migration? Mert azt szeretnénk, hogy a magyarok megmaradjanak abban a, az értékrendben, abban a... És hát az, hogy más vallású, más nemzetiségű emberek teljesen más kultúrával tömegesen bevándorolnak ide Magyarországra, de hát ugye ez egy olyan dolog, ami, amit, amit nem lehet már visszafordítani. While some Americans hope to export the family policy back to the U.S., they're also importing their very American ideas to Hungary. Rod Dreher is a senior editor of the American Conservative magazine and a New York Times best-selling author. Tonight he's hosting an event with Scholl at the Skirton Cafe to promote his latest book, which slams what he calls the totalitarianism of woke culture in the U.S. So I want to ask you, Rod, what do you think is the biggest lie that is currently going around our society today. I think the most consequential one is the loss of the gender binary, the idea that gender is fluid and that male can be female, female can be male. But this is the tyranny of minorities. What I would like to see is a society that is anti-woke a society that values freedom of expression, freedom of religion, basically America like I grew up in. If you come over here to Hungary, you'll find that you can get a much more respectful hearing for your ideas here in this conservative country than back in America. So you're coming here to learn from this kind of, can I call it a new conservatism? that's been created by the Orban government? The traditional conservative thinking, if tradition goes back to Ronald Reagan, is that the small government is what we want. Well, that is so outdated. Orban is not like that. He is a conservative, but he's not afraid to use the power of the state to achieve certain goals. Can the Orban model work in the U.S.? I think that if we can see what Orban is doing, and we Americans can take it back home and do things like what's happening in Florida now. DeSantis signed a bill that would keep uh, public schools from discussing sexuality and, and gender uh, up to age nine in the public schools. This is modeled on a far more broad bill here in Hungary that was passed by the Orban government last year. It turns out that DeSantis signed this bill, came up with this bill from having watched Orban, I'm told. Governor Ron DeSantis has signed into law what critics call the Don't Say Gay Bill. The Orban model is gaining steam in the U.S. as policies rooted in what conservatives consider a traditional definition of faith and family spread across the country. Republicans are trying to make 2022 the year of the anti-trans bill. And it's not just the policies that are changing. Institutions are getting overhauled in the conservative image as well. In a sweeping ruling that overturned a half a century of precedence, five justices ended the right of American women to choose abortion under the Constitution. It situates the trajectory of the American right to make us in, uh, in the image of Hungarian illiberal democracy now. The new vanguard of the Republican Party is embracing Orban and his big government style of conservatism. Viktor Orban, who is of course the bugaboo of nearly every liberal in the mainstream American media, has implemented a couple of policies that I think are really interesting. Back in Budapest, Papin believes it's just a matter of time before Orban's ideas become mainstream for the American GOP. The family policy is an example of big government, the government intervening. How are you going to convince U.S. conservatives that this is a good thing when for decades they've been, you know, huge proponents of small government? Things can change really rapidly. I mean, five years ago, we wouldn't have been having a conversation in Budapest about the future of American conservatism. You know, that's how political change works. I think it's like a slow percolation, and then, you know, in some opportune moment, you know, you can make a change. So what is it about Orban's ideology and style of governance that's attracting right-wing Americans to him? 
Yeah, great question. And it's really hard to sum it up in just a few words, but clearly there is something about this leader who is vehemently anti-leftist, anti-liberal. He embraces Christianity. He is cracked down on LGBTQ people in Hungary. Um, and he's, like I said, led one of the harshest crackdowns on refugees and, and migrants, especially refugees and migrants of color uh, across Europe. That has made him such a darling of conservatives around the world, and in particular in the United States. But what's interesting about Orban is he's not doing it in a kind of traditional, a traditionally conservative way, meaning, you know, for a long time, for, for decades, Western conservatism has been led by leaders like Ronald Reagan in the U.S. or Margaret Thatcher in the U.K., who were very, quote unquote, small government conservatives. They wanted the government out of people's affairs. Orban isn't like that. He's a, quote unquote, big government conservative. He wants to use the full might of the Hungarian government to implement his policy. But he's also done things like taking control of state media, gerrymandered electoral districts, uh, stacked the courts, even changed the constitution in his favor. And all of that has earned or Orban the authoritarian label that's used by many people in Europe today. So Matthew, you've crisscrossed across the whole world in your reporting over the years, Orban, Trump, are these men in their authoritarian leanings exceptions to the democracies that you've covered or symptoms of a bigger problem that you see coming? Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I would agree that this is a trend. And I think a large part of the reason is the failure of the left, certainly in Europe. You know, for many years, the, the left and liberal forces have been in power and they've done a lot to maintain the status quo while inequality, climate change, racism continues to get worse. While the right, and you don't have to agree with it, especially the far right, has shown that it has a very clear identity. Whether it's Donald Trump in the US or Viktor Orban in Hungary, the right has shown that it's willing to subvert democracy in order to achieve its goals. And that's something that should be concerning for all of us. Matt Castle, thanks for being here. When we come back, we shift to the states where officials closer to home are using their control over state power to punish enemies and stamp out opposition. It's a vision where government isn't by and for the people, but a weapon in the culture war. I don't care what corporate media outlets say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what big corporations say. Here I stand. I'm not backing down. <laughs> This is Breaking the Vote. I'm Todd Zwillick. States are supposed to be the places where government is closer to the people. They're the places where governors can experiment with new ideas, new policies, before they're ready for the national stage. Remember when a conservative Republican governor named Mitt Romney did Obamacare in Massachusetts way before it was called Obamacare? You get the picture. But we're in a GOP era now where cultural grievance is way more important than policy. And some states are becoming laboratories of another kind. State officials are finding new ways of using state power, not to set policy, but to fight the culture war and increase their profile for the moment when Donald Trump leaves a vacuum at the top. Former President Donald Trump and his Republican sidekicks are howling that President Biden is using an unfair weapon against them, the government. We are a nation that has weaponized its law enforcement against the opposing political party like never before. Now, this is clearly aimed at discrediting the FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago and all of his other legal problems. But all of this whining is kind of ironic, since many Republicans actually are using their government official powers to go after political foes. Trump spent his entire presidency doing exactly that. When he wanted dirt on Hunter Biden, Trump tried to strong arm Ukraine to find it for him by withholding military aid. That got him impeached, you know, the first time. Then Trump used troops to chase Black Lives Matter protesters away from the White House so he could get himself a little photo op. And after he lost the 2020 election, he allegedly tried to get the Justice Department and other GOP officials to bend the law in a desperate attempt to stay in office. Now his ham-handed efforts sometimes fell flat. 
but other Republicans have stolen his shtick, and they're doing it even better. Take Trump's most likely rival for the 2024 GOP nomination. We're certainly not going to bend a knee uh, to woke executives in California. When Disney spoke out against Florida's Don't Say Gay law, Governor Ron DeSantis wanted a way to retaliate. So he stripped the state's largest employer of its special tax status. And when some companies embrace Black Lives Matter, Florida Republicans fought back by banning diversity, equity, and inclusion training if they made employees feel guilt or anguish based on their race. And it's not just Florida. Arkansas and West Virginia have stopped doing business with companies who want to address climate change. And when Coca-Cola and Delta came out against Georgia's restrictive new voting law, Republicans responded by threatening their tax breaks. And if a company won't do business with the oil, gas, or gun industries, Texas won't do business with them and won't let them invest in the state's bond markets either. Congressional Republicans are also trying to use their power against corporations going, as Republicans would say, woke. In May, Florida Senator Marco Rubio introduced a bill to strip tax deductions from the companies that cover employee expenses for out-of-state abortions or gender-affirming care for employees' trans kids. And Missouri Senator Josh Hawley is going after big tech for being too liberal by trying to bust them up. These companies are monopolies, Sean. They have too much power. The liberals want to have this liberal, big government, big business alliance. We need to break it up. Besides big tech, big banks, and big Mickey Mouse, Republicans are targeting normal people, too. There was that horrible story about that 10-year-old rape victim being denied an abortion in Ohio and having to travel to Indiana. Well, Republicans first tried to deny the story was true at all. And then when they were proven wrong, Indiana's Republican Attorney General threatened to use the full power of his office to investigate the doctor who treated that girl. We have this uh, abortion activist acting as a doctor with a history of failing to report. So we're gathering the information, we're gathering the evidence as we speak, and we're going to fight this uh, to the end. The doctor has filed for damages, the first step towards a possible defamation lawsuit. And DeSantis's latest target is former felons who voted last election. He made a big, big show of arresting 20 of them last month. But they all had been allowed to register to vote. And many said they thought they were allowed to vote under the state's new law. All this might pale in comparison to what could happen if Trump, or another MAGA Republican, wins the White House in 2024. Trump and his closest allies have made it clear they'll use the government to seek revenge on their enemies. We're at war. We're at a political and ideological war. And they've obviously weaponized the, the Justice Department. And we're going to have to fight fire with fire. The way to do it you is know, win election, win them overwhelmingly, and then use the appropriations process to choke down the FBI and choke down the Justice Department and get to the bottom of who approved this. Other Trump allies have gone even further. Rudy Giuliani said if Trump wins in 2024, quote, the first thing he'll do is raid every one of Biden's houses. Trump's closest allies have already hatched a plan to make it easier to wield the government however they want by firing career government employees in mass if he wins in 2024. General Mark Milley, Trump's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that Trump's team, quote, shook the republic to the core with their actions on January 6th. And he wondered, can you imagine what a group of people who are much more capable could have done? We might be about to find out the hard way. Still much more breaking the vote up ahead as we speak with one secretary of state on the receiving end of violent rhetoric, including at least one bomb threat in the days after the 2020 election. She says she won't be intimidated into silence. It's not easy to make me frightened, but it made me chilled. Ultimately, authoritarians want to control everyone. And we've already seen this in the GOP. Some of the worst threats are Republicans threatening other Republicans who won't fall in line. So everybody should be very clear that although Democrats may be the most obvious victims, everyone becomes a target under an authoritarian style of rule. That was the expert on strongmen, historian Ruth Ben-Ghiat. She'll be joining me later in the program as she sounds the alarm on the authoritarianism working its way into American politics and why those inside the GOP 
should be just as concerned as everyone else. But up next, I speak with one Secretary of State who was on the receiving end of death threats in the weeks and months after the 2020 election and January 6th, and also while trying to steer her state away from partisan power grabs and voting audits. You're just part of the deep state and you're following their lip service. Your kids are gonna pay the price for your stupidity. I can't believe that you are even trying to pretend that you're Secretary of State when you're just a piece of crap. Now to Arizona, a key swing state and a battleground in the fight for voting rights and democracy. Joe Biden won in Arizona by just under 11,000 votes in 2020, and then it became a cauldron of conspiracy theories and stolen election disinformation. Despite its increasingly diverse electorate, Arizona Republicans turned around and passed restrictive new voting laws and ran a partisan election review that created an environment where election workers feared for their lives. The Republican nominee for governor, Kerry Lake, regularly spouts lies like this. We had a rigged, stolen election. The facts are there. The forensic audit proves it. We have a lot that? of people who are, were part of the corruption. They watched a corrupt election happen, and then they certified a corrupt election. Arizona Secretary of State Katie Hobbs is Lake's Democratic opponent in the very tight race for governor. I spoke to Secretary Hobbs about what's on the line in this race. Secretary Hobbs, there are election deniers running at almost every important level in your state. Governor, Senator, Attorney General, Secretary of State. From your Secretary of State position for now, maybe not governor candidate, what's at stake here? Well, I think the future of our democracy is at stake. We have seen uh, coordinated attacks uh, on our elections since before the 2020 election, and they've continued to play out in the form of continued false allegations of fraud, sham audits like we saw play out in Maricopa County, threats against election officials, and then running these election deniers in every position in order to get their hands on the power to change the rules and potentially overturn the will of the voters if they don't like the outcome of future elections. I mean, up until 2020, Arizona had a reputation as one of the good voting places in America. Maricopa County had easy mail-in voting, easy registration. It was sort of a model place. What happened? We are still a good place to vote. Our mail-in system was looked at as a model when folks were trying to ramp up mail-in voting efforts during the pandemic, and we'd had it in place for decades. It is secure, and none of that has changed. What's changed is you have someone who is a sore loser and cannot accept that, and he's misleading a whole bunch of followers into continuing these false allegations. Is that how you think Arizona became sort of ground zero for election denialism. I mean, when people talk about this phenomenon, believe me, we talk about it all the time, it seems like yes. we're looking at Arizona constantly. Yeah, well, we certainly ended up as ground zero. And I'll tell you, before the election, myself and colleagues across the country were looking at all the potential things that could happen and play out. We knew there would be all kinds of legal challenges. We knew that, for the most part, they would be baseless. And that is exactly what we saw. Nine court challenges were thrown out in Arizona. And Trump and his allies were trying to get this sort of sham audit off the ground wherever they could. So I've talked to so many election officials in Arizona who got death threats, other threats after 2020. I think you're not alone. You've received threats like this one. We're taking all of you mother communist out. Just know that your fraud, your crimes, they're all being uncovered right now. You ran the most corrupt criminal election ever in the history of Arizona. Secretary Hobbs, What's the impact of threats like that? We've covered the impact on individuals. I'm interested in the impact on how the election is run and people's ability to do their jobs. It's very difficult and challenging. Uh, and I think that is part of the intent. I think for the most part, the folks making these kinds of threats and harassing statements are being misled. And there are elected leaders and people in positions of political power instigating these kinds of threats with their rhetoric. And they don't care. They're intending to sow chaos and they're intending to upend the systems so that they can have basis to challenge the results. I want to ask about your opponent, 
Terry Lake, former uh, television news anchor running on the Republican side. I got to tell you from way across the country, and I'm not in Arizona, I see a lot of coverage of your race for governor. I really only see Carrie Lake. She gets in the headlines all the time. She makes incendiary statements. She's always making news, a lot of times with election lies, but with other stuff too. And it sort of makes me wonder if there's a perverse incentive here. She gets in the news all the time. She has really great name ID, as they call it. Over here in New York, where I am, I gotta say, Carrie Lake is getting a lot of ink. Well, it's a good thing that the folks in New York that are seeing that ink aren't voters in Arizona, but I can tell you that in Arizona, um, I enjoy very similar name ID to Carrie Lake, thanks to the election lies of the 2020 election and beyond that Carrie Lake has helped to promote. And folks in Arizona absolutely understand what's at stake in this election. And they have seen me stand up and continue to fight these election lies, fight to protect their uh, freedom to vote and 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 the votes that they cast and they know that Carrie Lake is running on this lie because she has nothing else to offer. How has life changed personally for you, I guess as Secretary of State, since the threat started? I, I don't want you to talk about specifics, I know you probably won't, but do, do you go anywhere alone anymore? How has life changed? I don't usually go anywhere alone anymore. I, and I think all the time about the people that I'm with in a public event, whether that's my staff or the people that are there, because my security is there to protect me, but there's often a lot of other people that might be at risk. And that's it's something that um, weighs on me all the time. Secretary of State of Arizona, candidate for governor, Katie Hobbs, thanks so much. Thank you so much. We reached out to Katie Hobbs' opponent, Carrie Lake, to invite her on this program. She declined. Up next, pretending America is too exceptional for authoritarianism won't make it go away. The growing fears of the strongman mentality working its way into American society and how that's scaring the hell out of the expert on the subject. It's not easy to make me frightened, but it made me chilled. Authoritarianism is on the rise around the world, while democracies in some places teeter. Here at home, it's on the rise too. A governor tries to use state power against a corporation that disagrees with him on LGBTQ issues in education. An attorney general in Indiana uses the law to intimidate an abortion doctor. A former president pulls every lever he can to stay in power after losing an election by seven million votes. At the pulsing heart of these anti-democratic movements usually sits a strong man, somebody with a force of personality who uses propaganda and corruption and violence to undermine institutions and stay in power. The question, is American democracy resilient enough to withstand these threats in a post-January 6th era? I spoke to historian Ruth ben Giat, author of Strong Men, on that and a lot more. Professor Ruth ben Giat is author of the book Strong Men and one of our country's foremost voices on strong men and authoritarians. Professor, thanks for being here. Sure, it's a pleasure. I want to start at the beginning of this story for so many Americans, probably not the beginning of the story for you on January 6th. <laughs> what was your reaction when you saw those crowds breaking the barricades, breaking the windows, marching through the Capitol with Confederate flags? I felt a lot of dread, um, but it appeared uh, immediately obvious to me that this was a coup attempt, and it was pretty clear to me that this was uh, Trump having incited this mob and trying to stay in office illegally. There's been this progression I've noticed, and a lot of people have noticed since January 6th, coming from Donald Trump and a lot of his allies. It goes something like this. January 6th wasn't really that bad. It was only just a couple of people, not really us. Then, okay, it was bad, but it wasn't us, it was Antifa, it was the FBI. Then, well, it was just really a tourist visit. Finally, you get to the end and you realize, well, okay, it was bad, but that's not what Republicans really are. To where Donald Trump is today, which is actually January 6th was good. The people who did it are patriots. They deserve pardons. We will treat those people from January 6th fairly. We will treat them fairly. That's a long progression, and I wonder if that progression is familiar to you, something that started with shock, oh my God, a riot, to actually, 
these people who rioted are the heroes? So when I look back at how they were trying to tell us that it was just like these people with painted faces, it was just tourists, you know, visiting the Capitol and that progression of those lies, it's in proportion to what we're finding out now in part three the hearings, how many people were involved. And we haven't, in some ways, we haven't even touched the iceberg of how many more people were involved as funders and, uh, you know, financial supporters. But the key moment was January 7th, when the GOP uh, could have uh, cast aside Trump because he was so toxic. And they knew very well what had happened, even though the American public perhaps didn't have all the news yet, the inside news. And they decided to double down. And so January 6th was a profoundly radicalizing event for the GOP. And once they made that decision, they were all in. And then over time, Donald Trump has been able to own it more fully and feel safe in in being emboldened by the violence. And so that's the trajectory we've been on, which is highly dangerous for our democracy. Donald Trump gave what was billed as a policy speech in Washington, D.C. He called for police to be mean and nasty when they do their jobs. From a historical perspective, how important is that as Donald Trump plots his possible return, that he's signaling the use of force, signaling violence, and signaling for police to get mean and nasty as he's done in the past? I analyze that speech carefully, and I'm, it's not easy to make me frightened but it made me chilled because um, it, that speech was an outline for a police state. Ultimately, authoritarians want to control everyone. And we've already seen this in the GOP. Some of the worst threats are Republicans threatening other Republicans who won't fall in line. So everybody should be very clear that although Democrats may be the most obvious victims, everyone becomes a target under an authoritarian style of rule. Has it surprised you how many Americans seem fine with this? I mean, part of it is good old partisanship, but there seems to be something a lot more insidious at work here. And I wonder if you think that this is just good old partisanship kind of cranked up to 11, or if there's something more and something more troubling going on among Americans themselves, that they're just kind of fine with the grift largely fine with the violence and in some cases looking forward to more violence to come. There are people who are deep in the disinformation tunnel and they're not receiving the same information um, and, and they haven't for a long time. They are operating in a different information universe and so the conclusions they draw are different. And then there are the people who are aware of what's happening and they approve. If someone is very bonded to a charismatic figure, they may know that the person is lying. But if that person, in this case, Trump, and, and it was the same with Hitler, is setting himself up as a truth teller, he's going to say the stuff that other people don't say, even if they think he might be stretching the truth, they approve of it because he's a rogue figure who's taking on the establishment. And then there's a the third category, the people who are freaked out and are perhaps a bit in denial, too. Ruth, thanks so much. Sure. That does it for this edition of Breaking the Vote. When we're back, how political violence is getting adopted into mainstream politics. We sit down with the people on the front lines of a political war on a changed Capitol Hill. Plus, we examine the emergence of great replacement theory, dominating Latino politics on the border, and a whole lot more. Make sure to sign up for our weekly Breaking the Vote newsletter. That's at vice.com slash breaking the vote. And we'll see you next time. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.